Right, and we are live. Hello and welcome to uh, the Rugby Fan Forum here on Forever Sports. It is less than a week after the World Cup, so we're actually still celebrating. I was, in fact, at a trophy parade this morning. Uh, half the country is still drunk. Damien Williams is still in his kit. Uh, the box <laughs> have yet to, to drink any water. I think it's it's been absolute chaos, but uh, very cool scenes. And I am joined uh, by Mr. Dan Scott and Wes, a bit of an international flavor. We've got uh, Dan over in the UK, Wes over in Botswana. So um, technology doing doing the business here and getting us all online here. First of all, gentlemen, how are we? Have we have we have we, have we sobered up? Are the, how how are the hangovers this week? I think, uh, I'm still I'm still sick. Monday Monday Tuesday work from home. Um, but if sick, I, if eh? I sound, yeah, <laughs> if I sound if I sound ill it's because I'm ill. <laughs> okay. And I'll I, I, I attribute at least seventy percent of that to the box. Gosh, fair enough. And, and where's have you have we recovered from the weekend? Yeah, it was a, it was a big one. Hey? Sunday was a, Sunday was the longest day of my life. Um, but but then it's you know you sort of you walk around here and and, and you know like people kind of know about the rugby world cup and there's more more football crazy here. But you see someone in a box jersey or, or, or sort of you catch their eye and you look and you nod and there's like this thumbs up and this like silent celebration. So that'd be <laughs> awesome just yeah. to, just to like sort of catch that, un, you know, sort of silent comms with people. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I know it was, it was, it was mentally, yeah. Um, yeah, people have just been, I've, I've heard people booking your work for them on Monday. I don't think Monday was particularly productive. Um, mm-hmm. lots of people, I mean, that was the one thing about today, you know, you're kind of watching these trophy parades, even Tuesday when you're watching them around the airport, you're like, do you guys like not have jobs? Like how are they like, yeah. Yeah, thousands but, of people everywhere like <laughs> like are you taking on leave are you guys just did she, the one person apparently said they tried to interview him and he said no i can't be interviewed i'm not supposed to be here <laughs> <laughs> the interest appointment yeah yeah so um but, hey that's, it is that is what we do uh down here we, we, we go big 100 percent um right so in terms of the show to come uh we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, the game last weekend we'll talk a little bit about uh, wayne barnes who's hung up his whistle uh, we'll talk about the future of the Springboks and uh, who's leaving, who's staying. You know, some of the players, for example, in terms of which players um, are, could be at the next World Cup, which players might not be at the World Cup. And then we'll, we'll end up looking at a little bit of a URC action this weekend. We need to give the URC a bit more attention now that uh, the uh, the World Cup is over so we can actually start to really get back into our URC, um, which, will, which will be quite cool. And uh, obviously, we've got our Boyle Sports segment as well. So a big shout out to Boyle Sports who do power the stream, which doubles as a podcast. So you can listen to this back on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, YouTube uh, Music, or your favorite um, audio streaming platforms. Uh, get your comments into the chat. Ask some questions, stuff like that. Um, we've got a poll running at the moment, which says, should Rusty Rasmus coach the Springboks again moving forward? Before we talk a little bit about the future, let's talk a little bit about the past. Saturday, what a game. And uh, Wes, uh, we, we jumped into the, the post-match show and it was absolute chaos. Uh, now that you've had a, a, a few days to, to settle in, let's, take a, let's, let's talk about that game. Um, a defensive masterclass, really. No, I mean, yeah, I, I think you know, if, if you've had a chance to, and, and hopefully everyone has watched the, the review show, I was lost for words. I think we all were. Steve, I know you were sort of in the, in the, in the watch-along as well. It was just what, a, what an awesome... What an awesome way! Like, uh, yeah, I'm still still struggling to find to sort of really encapsulate how it felt. But no, I think I think absolutely right. I think mm-hmm. defense, you know, slotting our kicks and defense won us that game, um, and we we were absolutely phenomenal on defense. I mean, we know we've all spoken about Peter Stefft toy, you know, with his 28 completed tackles, which is an absolute huge. And the thing is, they weren't just completed tackles; they were big tackles. They were crunching tackles. Dominant, they were tackles at key tackles. moments yeah. as well. Dominant tackles at key moments tackles. on key players. Yeah, yeah, no, and Jordy and... Bad still, still, still checking under his bed for him, just trying to work out where yeah, he is. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and I see the comments about you know Jordy missed that kick because of you know the, the, what PSTD PTSD. I get a mouthful there, yeah. but um, yeah, no, absolutely huge, and and we've said it before, right? And everyone likes to say it. It's a line that people throw away. Defense wins games, and defense wins World Cups. I think well, that we saw attack, last attack sales tickets, defense wins titles. You know. Yeah, there we, there we go. And what we saw on Saturday was exactly that. Dan, can Jacques Nielba call himself the best defense coach in the world? <laughs> I mean, in the calendar year 2023, absolutely. Uh, like well, 2019, he's got, he's got two, he's, he's, he's organized yeah. defense to two, two World Cup yeah. wins. I mean, it's funny because I, I remember that 
that actually I felt as a year in 2019, I felt a lot more secure in artifacts. I just felt we weren't going anywhere backwards. Whereas actually in the years in between the World Cups, I felt like it kind of got led astray. Like I think mm. we only conceded like four tries at the last World Cup and probably a similar amount in this one, um, which was insane at the World Cups. But in between, it seemed like we had lost something. But the resurgence of it, and it's almost like the game again back of the resurgence of Peter Steff, like he was kind of a little bit out of form and up and down and people went to shore. And then it's just game time for the box. World Cup, we hear, and it's like everything has just been prep. And I know they speak about it saying, like, everyone just remembers World Cups. No one cares about, like, other games in between and stuff like that. And, like, it's never been more clear than in the in the way – that we won both of these World Cups and the time spent in between them. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think I like the sort of ideas to sort of research the defense, and and I do think that it's interesting. You know, I think we had two years, which you know, obviously we had one year which was purely just win the British Night Lions series, um, yeah. and then after that, you know, there does seem to be this 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 willingness to lose games or to to change for this World Cup. You know, it was almost like we'd already forsaken the next two other championships. We sat there saying, you know, we don't really care. We're just going to go and try and start building for this World Cup. And I think, you know, we, we did see how the game plan evolved. Uh, it's very lazy analysis to go and sit there saying that we're playing exactly the same as we did in 2019 because it's completely no. different. Um, yeah. Defensively, at, at, attacking-wise, you know, player personnel-wise, it's it's a completely different team, despite there being the same sort of players and the very similar coaches. And um, we had to be because a lot, of people, yeah. a lot of teams became like 2019 Springboks. Like mm. literally, England's game in the semi-final was yeah. the most United Springboks that we've ever seen, more than we ever were. Yeah, yeah no, hundred percent. And 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 you know, we started seeing six twos, which were not a new concept when uh, when when we, we we deployed it, but um, it wasn't the norm. And all of a sudden, you know, for example, this World Cup, six two splits were very common. Um, the whole sort of forward, forward orientated thing. I mean, Eddie Jones was in fact the one that actually teased the idea of a seven one split earlier this year. He joked about a seven one split, and then we said, "Oh no, no, you know, he's never going to do it." And yeah, he didn't do it, but then the box did it. So yeah, it's interesting how how things have changed, and and at the same time, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And and there was a certain amount of brutality to the box performance last week, despite it not necessarily being the biggest block team of all time. I mean, it's funny when you talk about the massive block forwards and yet two of our top performers and Dion Free and Quaker Smith aren't exactly, you know, the two of your your, your biggest sort of players. Uh, Wes, let's talk a little bit about that pack. Um, wouldn't say set piece wise, we were phenomenal. Um, the lineouts were an issue, especially when Bongi went went off. Um, and scrums, we, we didn't quite ever get the dominance that we had in, in previous weeks. Um, you know, do you think you can attribute to that to the loss of Bongi? I think both in scrums and, and Lana playing quite a big role. Did New Zealand just do very well to neutralize that aspect? Why, why do you think that we didn't manage to maybe gain the ascendancy from a set piece perspective that we would have liked to have had and, and maybe had in previous games? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you know, we everyone was looking forward to seeing that battle and and you know, Bongi going off well, that was massive, right? I think there were two players you didn't want to get injured, it was Bongi and it was Fuff. And, yeah. and within the first couple of minutes, we saw Bongi go down and it was like, oh, goodness, here we go. And, um, yeah. you know, I think in terms, of, in terms of the scrums, I think the All Blacks just pitched up big time. I think they would have been pumped up. They would have been absolutely firing. You know, we, we had some choice words for, for the All Black front row um, early on in the tournament. I think we, we were quite critical of them and, and we kind of said, oh, it's not really a competitive or technique front row. And fair play to them. They, they made us eat our word because then they really turned it on and they were getting a lot of Antled Island scrum as well. Again, you know, a scrum that had been doing very well in the tournament. Um, so, so I think they, they just turned up to play and, and potentially even had a little bit of an edge on us, you know, despite um, our scrum being what it is. Uh, line out time, they were all over us. And, and I was trying to keep calm and I tried to think, I thought, okay, you know, we, we were disrupting Island's line out and then they got it together. So, so we'll get it together. And just, we never really seemed to, to quite get it quite there. Um, and I do think that probably was was Bongi. We were missing Bongi there to potentially uh, find, you know. But but you still had the jumpers and the callers, and uh, we just couldn't quite seem to get to New Zealand. I mean, they they knew where we would be vulnerable, you know, with one of our key players off, and they absolutely went for us. Yeah, interesting. You know, I mean, New Zealand's lineup wasn't wasn't perfect, so it was interesting how neither side it was actually that for me was one of the most interesting aspects. Neither side had that go to mm -hmm. set piece where it was like chips are down, we're under pressure. You know, we're going to kick deep for them, force a line-out because we can go to a line-out and we can, and we can re-establish a platform. It wasn't the case of 
put a bit of pressure, force a knock on, take a scrum, and we can use that to to establish some pressure. So it yeah. was interesting, and the neither side really had that front foot ball to to really be able to attack from. And New Zealand had a couple of very good lineups, but I mean, we saw that like something hit from PSJF Toy on, on Jordy Barrett, where we had almost sort of pre worked out that's going to be the move. And they're just, yeah. you know, neither side really managed to build up momentum at times. It was, you know, it was always, it wasn't like this very long passage of play where a side was just all over each other and stuff to forget. It was a little bit stop start at time. Um, but Dan, I mean, it's, 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 it's all a little about the defense. I want to talk about some of the backline players and, and someone who stood up as, as we kind of waited for. Um, but the likes of a Jesse Creel, for example, next to a PSDF the toy, you know, the way that we read that incredibly dangerous New Zealand backline, you know, and, and, and how a player like Rico Awani was, was very absent at times. And we're talking about a Will Jordan who was about to, you know, set to score the try scoring, you know, break the try scoring record. He's been scoring tries for fun. Probably one of Will Jordan's quietest games. In fact, he got subbed. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, you can't, you can't, um, give him enough credit for the game management and dis- defensive management. Like, obviously, you, you when you think defense, you think Peter Steph toy hitting, you know, someone. But, I mean, it was almost like, I felt like Lukanya Am was like the original, like, mastermind behind, like, making things go away before they happened, right? And I feel like that's what the Springbok defense is so good at doing. It's like knowing how to read the game and our center um, pairing of JC and, and Damien have been superb at that in being able to nullify and read the game so well that the person, they either knew the, the person was going to get the ball or they were putting themselves in, in a position to be able to stop it when they do. Um, yeah. you, you really, yeah, again, you, you, you can't take your head off. And, and a lot of that is just a rugby player's willingness to work ready hard for the tireless things that gives you zero glory and 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 think that's what exactly what both of our centers do yeah 100 i think i said i think the reading was i mean there was there was a there was a i watched the clip back and there was a dummy run and it was such it was the perfect dummy it was just played right behind and jesse creel just delayed by like a fraction of a second mm-hmm. making that hit so you could actually read that the pass was going behind and he actually managed to adjust and it's just those sort of small things where he decides the ball is going there and he commits there's the gap Rico Wani into the middle, and we've seen the story a thousand times. You know, the patience and the accuracy of the defense was was second to none. Um, Hondre Pollard, ice in his veins, and uh, and Faf de Klerk, who, who couldn't afford to get a yellow, couldn't afford to get injured. You know, the halfback pairing, where it's our most experienced halfback pairing of all time. Do we start putting in a conversation as, our, as the best halfback pairing of all time? They've started two World Cup finals, they've won two World Cup finals. Well, yeah, if, if you want to look at, you know, it's always how do you define best, right? And, and then mm-hmm. I was watching um, the, the videos you've been putting out, Steve, which have been great, and, and talking about the Springbok side and um, and looking at is it the best Springbok side? And it's like, how do you, what are you defining as the best, you know? Because if you want to define it by the greatest scrummages or the best defense or whatever, the time period, it, it can change. Greatest drinkers, but, for but, example, you know, the yeah, important yeah. Exactly. Um, although I think these box, you know, might be up there. I mean, I've seen those videos of Malcolm Marx and Oak is for and, and Kitzel, um, yeah, having no, two, a the two of them like, think, time. Have you seen that video with Damien? Damien Williams are having a time, and those two are obviously, you know, quite a few beers. And they're busy like sobbing on each other's <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> you just know the time of night. Yeah. You know? It's just it's awesome. But um, but no, going back to your question about the, the pairing. I mean, you know, there's something to be said for for that experience and knowing that 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 partnership is so vital and 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 knowing where that person is going to be and you start just intuitively playing right getting into that flow zone where you're actually not thinking you're just doing and the less thinking is better because as soon as you think you start to doubt and if you doubt then that's where mistake and error creeps in and i think having that pairing between fuff and and pollard was 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 key it was essential you know and we'll never know um, we'll never know what would have it looked like if, if Marnie had started or played, you know. Um, it, it would be very difficult to say who would have won or lost because I think it would have been a very different game. But that was the call they made and it turned out to be a correct call. I'm not going to say it's the right call because that implies the other one is wrong. It was a correct mm-hmm. call because we, we, you know, we won the World Cup. But um, no, hats off to, to Polly for just slotting those kicks, standing up, doing his job. I mean, that's what you want out of, out mm-hmm. of any player. You just want them to get onto the field and do their job and do it bloody well. Yeah, the most points in the Rugby World Cup final, Andre Pollard. But also, like, we, we know the Springboks in Rugby World Cup finals, and, and it's what every team should take into a World Cup final. It's like, get points on the board. Like, even at the last yeah. World Cup, 
you know, I think we scored our first try in the 60 something minute. You know, it wasn't like we blew England out of the water with tries out of the gate. We were exchanging mm-hmm. penalties. And when I th- it was, I think it was the second one where it was probably a 45 meter one, or like back on the left, on the left from like the 10. Um, I was like, geez, okay, if you're not going for, for corner here, like this is a tough kick, you know, like you, there's no ways we're going for anything that anything that's kickable is being kicked at, you know, mm-hmm. and and then if if we small blood, maybe there's a yellow card or, or something like that. Although they probably kicked that when they did have a yellow card, um, you know, if, if there was a real opportunity to kind of you know go at the jugular, then I think they would have maybe gone for the corner. But the scoreboard pressure was enough, and you know, our first half performance was so dominant that we could have just what well, we thought we would just you know continue going in that fashion. Just like no hiccups, three points after three points. Yeah, it's funny how that that, that red card, Sam Sam K, in many ways galvanized, you know, in, in the yeah. blacks. I was sort of sat there saying, right, well, we're gonna we have just forty men. So I knew there was yeah. gonna be trouble though. I knew there was gonna be trouble. That 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 all blacks team, as soon as that happened and it yeah. went down to fourteen, I knew it was gonna be harder for us. Well, that, it's it's weird because you know that that all black side has actually had a bit of a habit of dying out in games and not having the best uh, second half and i think there was a sad or something that like the springboks hadn't lost a second half points wise in like two or three years or something or something silly you know so all the stats point sort of one way in many ways and stuff like that but i think that's supposed to what makes a world cup final a world cup final is that you take the trends you take the stats and they go out the window the only stat which i think hold true was the fact that still the team has ended at half time has gone on to win but only by one, only by one point. Yeah, I mean, our, our lot, the last point we kicked over, I think, was in the thirty-third minute. Yeah, yeah. it's just so, nuts. But like, um, yeah, let's 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 have a word on uh, on 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 the All Blacks, uh, a side that wasn't tipped to go this far. Wes, uh, Ian Foster last year, you caused him to be sacked. Uh, he got a little bit sm- more smug, I think, is a good word, as the comment went by. So they're saying, "Well, you want to be sacked? Now I'm in a World Cup final. I got one." 180 minute performance away from me in a, in a World Cup. Um, you know, I I've put a lot of emphasis on the on their scrum, and I, and I've said a lot. You know, I think when Ethan Nguyen started playing in the scrum, started getting a lot better, and uh, Shannon Fazal and, and the pack improved, we started to see it evolve. But I think a word on the experience: you, Brody Otalik, Sam Whitelock, your Bowden Barrett, Aaron Smith, for example. You know, key players: Sam Kane in the form that he showed during the World Cup. Yes, there are lots of exciting young players in that New Zealand side. They've got two great players of the year, Mark, Mark Talaia, for example, who won it, Tabati Williams, you know, a Will, a Will Jordan who's still pretty young. But the experience stood up a lot during during this, this tournament. And do you think that just sort of a bit of a constant reminder that um, don't write off the experience? Because when it comes to tournaments like this, you can have all the talent in the world, but without the right composure, without the right mentality, it, it can be squandered. I mean, there's one team that comes to mind, you know, when you're talking about this, and that's Australia. You know, if, if we look at, at, at the difference there, you know, Eddie Jones made those massive calls to leave two very experienced Oaks behind. And, and it's not just about experience. You know, there was a clip that came out where the Oz were playing someone, and I think they were down or behind. And, you know, it was Quaid in the middle just talking to them, saying, this is what they're doing. This is what we need to do. We're all in the clear. Like, yeah, everyone, it just just the small, the calm, calm, said, calm, cool, yeah. composure. We've been here before, boys. This is what we need to do. You know, and it's someone to look to. And I think, you know, I feel for, um, oh, his name's escaping me. Who was the young 10 they took? Not uh, 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 Gordon. 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 Cat Gordon. And, 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 yeah, yeah, Carter to, to have the drum. pressure like that on his shoulders, and then when he when he had the, the the performance he did, you know that that big loss, you know, to to be able to to have someone he can go to, and and someone to, to say it's okay, mate, it's just it's one game, this that, you know, and I mean, you wonder is, I, I hope he's going to be able to come back from that because that's the kind of loss and the defeat and the experience that can potentially crush a player you know someone who's so promising and so good and you kind of let them out too early you know there's 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 something to be said for blooding players you you get them experience but it's almost like if you want to think about it in terms of like a vaccine you, you're exposing them in a safe way in a sense you expose them to danger but there's always that 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 protection of the older guys the experience yeah. so that when those older guys aren't there they're like hey we've been through this before i know what to do you know now there's now there's there's that strength that they can find so yeah i mean i think you know huge credit to the all black um old heads you know who came in and i think they were the ones probably who lifted the team um because as you, you're right steve they i mean i have to be honest i thought that, that these all blacks are nowhere um and especially when we completely dismantled them 
um, at Twickenham. You know, I, I, I was I was concerned there. I remember after that game, I said, "Trust me, this team will will if, if they've got the choice to lose that game in the way they did and win the World Cup, they'll take that deal every time." Yeah, and they, they almost yeah. flipped and did it. Yeah. yeah, I believe I believe I believe you said that you know if if, if they were to choose to lose ninety five nil or something along those lines and and win the World yeah. Cup, so yeah, no, I don't think it's a good point, um, Dan. You know this this All Blacks. Uh, I mean, we've said goodbye to a so yeah. I mean, Brody Tannock, Sam Whitelock. I mean, we have to go back a long time before you start watching with without those two in in the centre of that New Zealand scrum. Aaron Smith, the best passer of a rugby ball of all time, in my opinion. Um, I don't think there's anybody better. Yeah, just the, you know. It's, the fingers. Just, just that, 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 yeah, you know, and it's the spiral, and just, and that, and that bullet pass, and he was just an absolute pleasure to watch and stuff like that. Bowden Barrett moving away, Richie Moanga, I think we Kowani, Dane Coles, for example. Um, mm. Lots of big names moving on. Do they cope, or do you think we're going to see a, a bit of a hit from the All Blacks next year? Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't. Maybe other than Dane Cole, like. Dan Coles, I think he feels like the only one who was maybe running on a little bit of steam. And it was a pity he didn't actually get his swan song. Like he, he didn't play in either the semi or the or the final. But I mean it almost still feels like like the performances that that Britannic and Whitelock were putting in, like immense. Aaron Smith, like mm -hmm. one of the best Aaron Smiths we've ever seen at this yeah. World Cup. And it's like mm -hmm. I must be so hard for these these people to know when that time is and and you know they have to have that belief that they made that right decision massive massive hole at, at scrum offs like someone that's that dependable in such a crucial position except except camera we got the camera we got era I'm, I'm so in there yeah, he wasn't even why, wasn't even starting that's why the last world cup wasn't even on the bench <laughs> like, that and because uh d mac didn't play 10. correct correct those yeah. two in the team and and they are and they win no but you're right you're right it's it's not even just yeah. young i think Roy was phenomenal but aaron smith has just been such a constant in that side mm -hmm. I, I do think they're going to miss the um sam whitelock a lot though not just this jumping ability but that that calm head in the change room it's there's something to be said about the most senior person that isn't your captain you know he's not necessarily the person you turn to but he's still amongst the players but he's just you know, to, to be able to play the amount of caps, he did 150 caps, not just for any international team, the All Blacks. Like, the how disciplined and, like, what a consummate professional you need to be. Just that tone that you set. I mean, I don't and, think that's been matched for a long, long time. No, yeah. no. I mean, I mean, we also saw Alan Wynne-Jones, but had he been a uh, New Zealand, he definitely wasn't playing that many. Not that he was, you know, far off it. But it's just, I think, I think that's going to be a massive massive um just caps to fill and and the, they do have a lot of caps and you know the likes of Rico Yuani and Jordy Barrett are barely 25 years old and they've got like 50 caps so you know they're, they're doing fine and they're, they're going to replace these people but I think there's still um there's going to be a big hole there yeah I think there's the best definitely a new gen though. I think players like Ardis Sevilla are going to become more important than ever you know I, I your Jordy Barrett now needs to stand up and take a bit of a leadership role because you could have a lot of new players in and around him um, with like a burden moving on, um, yeah, interesting to sort of see how, if this sort of opens the, the the doors for your Antonella Browns to start coming back and getting a bit more involved. Like there were Damian McKenzie, for example, who's back playing in New Zealand, where he'll suddenly start getting a bit in time at ten. Um, as uh, the crow tips, good old uh, Chris, who's not joining us, says the, the All Black side coached by Ray is going to be fun. I'm very interested to see the the, the, the approach he goes. You know, whether he's going to go, and maybe ways you can expand on this. You know, as All Blacks now, you sit there going right reset it is a reset you know they've lost five six players lost the world cup you know there are players who haven't retired but you know you look like you look at uh cody taylor for example and you said they're going right he's 32 years old i think he's playing some great rugby but you're sitting there, right he's 32 years old do we keep him do we you know do we need to stop bringing in new blood there are a lot of players that kind of sort of suddenly fall into that category where they might not be 30 31 years old and you're thinking well they could still be around the next world cup cycle and you know how do you how do you do you blood new players and start building a new team? Do you press reset and go sort of the Andy Jones approach? Probably not to that extreme. Yeah. But he's also, it's not only just a new player, it's a new era of coaching as well. You know, he's going to have a different vision. His all black vision might not have included players that, that Ian Foster had, for example. Sam Kane, you know, is he going to be playing again? You know, what, what do you think the approach might be? Or what are the pros and cons from going, you know, one versus the other? Yeah, I mean, I think 
there have been there have been coach changes before, obviously, right? Um, and every time that you know the new coach will come in and bring a bit of himself, and that's what you want. Obviously, you know, Razor has been chosen for a reason, right? He's had immense success in the past, and I think they're hoping that he emulates that with with the All Black team now on the national level. Um, but you have to; it's it's a delicate balance between coming in and and doing things your way, but then also not rocking the boat too much. I feel like I feel like there's there's systems in place, or there's things that could be done, or there's players potentially, and there's there's structures that he might have to work around. Now, whether he does that, uh, we'll have to see. But you know, you, you, the Eddie Jones, as we said, has gone in completely, thrown out all those systems and structures, and it's you know sort of hit the self-destruct button, and potentially that acts as a bit of a warning for for other coaches. But no, it'll be fascinating to see what what his plan is, and and you know, I think Dion Ferry, I think, has given a lot of uh, forwards mm-hmm. in their thirties uh, hope. You know, their, their early thirties because. I mean, we saw the 38-year-old take to the field, play, was it 78 minutes, however long it was, and, and, and win a World Cup final, which and is an immense effort for and him. And as the captain on the field when we won. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, what wow. a flipping story. Which so. is mental, eh? Because, like, Pollard was still on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, like, yeah. like there were options that could have like, <laughs> they could have taken over the captain. I mean, that decision, I mean, nothing against you, but I mean, it's not like he's even captains the, the Storm and stuff like that. And they said, no, it's fine, you know. Don't don't worry about don't worry about uh, Pollard there. Don't stress about JC Creel and and you know Damien Delendi, who's been there for years. Don't don't stress about that 50 cap for after close. He also plays flag for the hookers though, Stevie. So you, true, you, true, true, true. Yeah, it's, a, it's a whole different like, yeah, it's, it's a different personality, it's an alter ego. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, but quickly to wrap up that question, you know, it's it's if you look at like England 2019, right? World Cup runner-ups got to the final and then imploded, right? I mean, I don't think England rugby's been looking good, so I don't think the All Blacks will do that. I don't think they're they're definitely not the same side, and I think they'll be better. But the the, the cautionary tale is here is that there's the potential for things to potentially go askew, um, you know. And and what does he do? Does he come in and say right? We were doing things well, but we didn't win. So do we chuck everything out? Is it the baby going out with the bathwater? Or do you just pick and choose? And you think this works and that works. And it all depends on the structure and what he wants to keep and what he wants to throw. So I know that's a real nothingy answer, but I, 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 I'm excited to, to see what he can do. Well, the interesting thing for next year is that pending on Michael Checker and whether he does renew or not, that's not been confirmed. We could see a rugby championship with four new coaches. Because it will be a new Australian coach, a new All Black coach, even if Rusty takes over, it is technically still a change of regime because there is no job, you know, although he is the head coach. So it's going to be a very interesting rugby championship with with all, all all the teams, you know, going through regime changes to a certain amount. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very keen to see sort of what 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 sort of changes that's going to happen. But let's talk about the box and um, you know what what their uh, now progression is so if we look at sort of coaches while well, so we've got felix jones with these jockey on the so immediately we looking for a new defense coach um and probably looking for somebody to, to work with the back line and um yeah i think i think we're also looking for um well, Tom playing personnel point of view yeah well if, if we are going to get a head coach. and interesting to see if, if rusty takes over or, or does he bring in a new head coach he's got one of those um Sort of aspects or, or specialities, for example. So, 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 Dan. I mean, what do you what do you think the 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 the, the route would go? I mean, do you see us appointing a new head coach? Do you see us, Rusty, just bringing in two new assistants and taking over? Where where are you at with that? Um, I'm gonna agree with uh, Smith Shaw and Rusty doesn't like the coach title, even though he calls the shots. I think um, he <laughs> he likes taking jabs at like the limelight and you know the classic the twitter stuff and just you know being a outspoken person but you know he has he now can do just that without facing questions at the press conference and i genuinely think that's a big part of it um and i think he's going to look for someone else that he feels can do a similar role to him and jacques like little like just a dynamic duo um you know kind of Flat hierarchy where it's, I think, not a lot of ego involved because I think mm-hmm. like as, as much as he is, takes up, I think, a lot of space in the room, I do believe that he gives a lot of the people around him um, equal opportunity to challenge him uh, and mm-hmm. say, this is what I think we should do. So, you know, uh, you're never going to bring in someone as big as like uh, Eddie Jones, who, who obviously that dynamic's not going to work. So 
you, you'd be surprised to see like a big name in rugby, um, at least from an international perspective, um, brought yeah. into it. But I think potentially um, someone rewarded, um, you know, from, from, from a, you know, who's done well in, in domestic competitions and a club level. I think on that point, Steve, I can jump in quickly, Dan. I think mm -hmm. the ego thing is really important because yeah. that was one of the big changes I think I noticed throughout the whole team this year, you know, where ego was completely out of it. And it wasn't about, you know, the, the individual player. And again, there's that quote from Dwayne um, where Victor called him, you know, when he wasn't selected to play at all in the Island game. And Victor said, are you okay? And Dwayne just said, look, one team, one vision. Um, and, and so that for me was huge, you know, where, where the ego was out of the room in every single role. They were still fiercely competitive athletes, right? Every single one of those 33 Oaks wanted desperately to be on the field and in that Springbok jersey. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But if you weren't selected, as the coaches say, I keep remembering from the press conference, they were gutted for a couple of hours and then they started studying their, who they were supposed to be that week. And it was just phenomenal. And, you know, those Oaks deserve as much credit as the guys who went on the field and won because they were the ones who facilitated it. So, yeah, I think, I think if we can see this, this no ego Springbok team going forward, I think we've got uh, many good years ahead of us. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, and it's, 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 it's such a cool experience last year when they had, so last year they had a bit of a media launch uh, for the box because we couldn't do it in 2021 because of um, sort of, sort of COVID and stuff again. And they basically sort of launched this brand new sort of season type thing. And I remember they, they announced a much wider squad and, you know, Albert Lowe sat next to Dion Free, and they both called us at the same time. And, you know, it was this concept of Dion Free is 38 years old, brand new in the squad, and he has got as much say as a 19-year-old Kana Moody, you know, and, and type like that. And there was the sort of sense of, yes, obviously there's a leadership group, which is very big. Um, but I loved, and especially where, 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 where Sia emphasized, he said, you know, everyone's got roles. You know, so he mm -hmm. says, if it comes down to a defensive point of view, he's going to shut up because he said he's not in charge of the defense, you know, and Dwayne mm -hmm. will then chat and, and will be pointing out, you know, and there's certain people that have got um, different sort of departments and stuff like that. Um, you know, something like a Marvin Ori, who I think played a little bit of an LTJQ role in 2019, where he wasn't playing a lot, but always on the water, for example, somebody doing a lot of studying, a lot of analysis. Um, and he was sort of that that link between the coaches and players and relaying messages and saying, all right, guys, this is what happened. So, yeah, I mean, once again, you know, I'm sure, you know, Chasing the Sun 2 has been it's been announced. So I'm sure we'll see a Dirt Trackers episode once again about the preparation, you know, Mon Debock running as with Chimawanga during the week and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that has been a big thing, and especially in the coaching staff. I mean, how much was one of the stick question when he was first appointed? He's now won two World Cups. Um, you know, Dion Davids, you know, when we had that very – when our forwards weren't dominating, our more had sort of gone backwards and everybody sat there going, hmm. You know, is Dion Davis good enough? And now, you know, he's he's the forward coach in, in charge of a seven-one split. You know, and um, so it's amazing how these coaches and and there is there does seem to be this inherent everyone's got a place at the table type thing, and everyone can um, can ask suggestions. So I, I think that when Rusty Rasmus spoke about you know the squad, he said we've got the right people here, not the right players. Mm. Uh, he said mm. the right people as well as the players in the squad. I think that's also extends to the coaches extends to the entire player group it's about having that right personality um and i think that there are Steve, players you, who yeah no i was gonna say do you think that why that's why the kanya arm was brought in because i never saw him getting onto the field right no, he was play. brought in because he's yeah because he's a here's oak and the oaks love him yeah. and their jaw and, 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 and also and from and familiar with the environment you know these guys did not yeah. when did they ever go out and bring somebody cold who's had not mm. been part of the setup for like Two three years and suddenly you go, yeah. Right, here you go. We you didn't know. have another. We didn't drop a thirteen. Like we didn't drop yeah, anyone yeah. into the World Cup that was like almost there. It wasn't like Evan Rose or something like that. Yeah, no, yeah. nobody was parachuted yeah. in. For example, nobody was making like their debut. No, I mean, no, did we? Have, I mean, I'm trying to think. If we had any debuts this year apart from like a Jean Klein. Um, and I don't, I don't think we did have any have any, have any Springbok debuts this year, if if memory serves me correctly. Um, no, no. Yeah. yeah so and, and that i think sort of shows as well whereas a couple of other teams might have had you know daily here and there um there's a very also, strong group if Lukanu needs to play you know 30 minutes he can he'll you know take a cortisone injection and you know you know every single play out of the back of his hand like you yeah. can't chuck in someone cold under that type of pressure like especially when you have someone like Lukanu has like a negative you know piece per minute in like a world yeah. cup final like just the cool calm man 
Yeah, it would have been very interesting had there been injuries to Jesse Creel, whether they would have gone with Lakanya or whether they've gone and said, no, well, Kane and Moody's fit to we cut it back. And that would have been a very interesting um, mm. thank scenario. Thank goodness we didn't stuff. need to go there. Yeah, well, I think it's a lot of thank goodness we didn't need to go there. You know, Faf getting injured, <laughs> yeah. he was going to play scrum off for the 18 minutes. Yeah. Uh, a lot, yeah, a lot of different... The three was a thank goodness we didn't need to go there, but we went there. <laughs> we had to, we had to go there. Yeah, no. Thank, thank, sorry, thank you. Thank there's only one we had to go there. Uh, no, also, we also had our star fly half like gone for sixty percent of the World Cup. Like, well, he, you know, he didn't go like, to the World Cup. He's, he currently can't play rugby. Elton Yankee. Yeah. He's still. He's still. <laughs> he's gonna go back 18. to Leicester and say I'm injured. <laughs> <laughs> still in rehab. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Dreadful. Yeah. No. But that's it. I mean, so it wasn't. It wasn't an easy road. It was definitely rocky. I mean, to go to the World Cup using Malcolm Ox, you know. But it's funny how there were so many external factors, and yet we talk about. It is if they weren't because of how well we coped. I mean, Bongi Manambi became, I don't think anybody can really get to Malcolm Box level at the moment. But I'll tell you what, the last month of Bongi Manambi is the best of Bongi Manambi I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been the biggest thing about this, this coaching staff is being able to eke that every last bit out of each player. And, and how many players who people didn't back stood up? You know, your, your Jesse yeah. Reels. You know, Franco Mossa, people are asking Franco Mossa, and obviously people are saying, no, we should take, we should take John Clayton ahead of Franco Mossa for the World Cup. And you see them going, how, why would you drop somebody who's been popped yet and, and look at the, the, the tournament he had? So, yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the team culture changed, well, not changed, but, uh, you know, how it progresses in, in the coming years. Big question now, the captaincy. So, Sia Khaleesi said that he's, one, he's available for the box. Not sure if you let Racing know because the French clubs absolutely hate it when players are available for their countries. So, um, but he has said that at this stage he's not retired. If he's if he's picked, he will play. Do we do we give him the captaincy again? I mean, or not, and that reason, this I mean, this obviously wouldn't be taking the captaincy away from. But how much do you sit there going right? So we've got one of our best captains there, but we know exactly how important he is. The likelihood, and maybe even more so because of this knee injury, is that he doesn't get to the next World Cup. Um, I think he's sitting on. I think he's 32 years old, so he'll be 36 years old. So he could mathematically look at DR3. But, you know, there's a there's a big question mark. Do you continue with him as captain? Or do you start looking at at, at who our next captain could be, for example, um, moving forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think as you said it, you know, there is that there is that leadership group. So it's a big group of guys. And, and I think the 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 captaincy role potentially actually on the field and decision making is is a lot less than what it used to be right mm. I, that's what i see it used, it used to be one oak making all the calls this is how it goes but we've seen that responsibility diffuse actually throughout the springbok team and it's worked out well but where seer is unique i mean the mistake will be trying to have another seer um because you because you, you won't so we, we need to get our heads around that at the moment that we will have someone different, something different, and they, they will be better in some ways, they'll be worse in some ways. But I think, again, if this culture can continue, um, it will, it will be, be a good thing. I do think you have to start looking, though, for your next captain. Um, I think to, to, to not would be short-sighted or potentially all eggs in one basket. Um, there is a new four-year cycle. As you said, Sia's 32, so he's 36 with that knee, who knows? Um, but I do think you start you start bleeding that new captain and start handing over more and more responsibility and have Sia mentor that. I mean, can you imagine Sia Khaleesi as your mentor? Um, I mean, what better sort of company to be in, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I, I, and, and yeah, as I said, to, to, to be able to sort of try to follow on for that it will be massive, which I think is why it would be important for him to be in the team and to be able to sit in front and say, well, that's my captain yeah. and I'm following him. Yeah. And, and imagine yeah. having that sort of backing. Chris is asking yeah. the right questions. Options. I think... Throw some, throw some at me, yeah, Dan. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, was I really like what you said, because I don't think they can... You're not going to match Sia. I don't think there's anyone who can exude, exude as much, like, humility as a person as he does, which, like, in turn brings such a, I think, calmness mm -hmm. to the Springs and takes so much pressure off. And that's the, that's the general egoless kind of Bach mm -hmm. camp um you know ideology that they're going for if you want to go you know okay who's definitely going to be at, starting at the next world cup probably go Andre. he's you know he's the guy he knows how to, he make he's making a lot of decisions on the field already um he has been a part of the setup since he's been 21 years old it's got more than enough 
<laughs> Except we never seem to go with well, this current coach I've never seen to go back line player. I mean, even the kind of I'm captain one or two SAA games, but you know, we've they went to Bongi, for example, before they went to Andre. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think who the and thing is that <laughs> we have such a yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the young gun. Um, thing is unfortunately and unfortunately, um they're all part of very similar generations. So many of them are 31, 30, 31, or 32, you know, and that's always that next age gap. It's like, do they make it? Do, don't they? So yeah. with a lot of people in that gap, and then you have quite a, quite a jump. You have like a couple of people in there, like 28, like a Achias Neyman, but I don't think yeah, he's. Mark Marx is 29, for example. But again, I don't think Mark Marx is going to be a Springbok no, captain. He's not, he's not, he's, he doesn't like the limelight. Like, and then, you know, you have, Kind of Jasper Visa again, like the, these people, they you don't they don't strike you as typical captains, and they haven't been captains mm-hmm. even at club level. So you can't now just expect them to fulfill that role. So I think because of that, at least for the next World Cup cycle, like the easy pick would be Andre. But I, to be honest, I still think they're going to stay with Sia. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a good chance that they might. I think that's an interesting point. You know, you talk about leadership group and you talk about the kind of. Um, Andre, Bongi, Sia, Dwayne, um, you know, even Peter Steff, for example, Eben, you know, I suppose Eben could be a, could be an interesting candidate because um, he's just looking, I mean, from an age perspective, I think he's, could be the same age or if not a year younger yeah, than year Sia. Younger. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, or was, yeah. I, mean, I think they're the same age, actually. I think they obviously play as under 19 together. Um, but it's... So yeah, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting to to see who who the candidates are because I do think that our entire leadership group does seem to be in the same sort of generation as you say. Um, yeah, Eben was the Eben, captain of last year. If you don't, if you yeah. if you if you remember correctly, between Adrian Strauss and Sia captain, it was Eben. Eben was like the interim um, captain. Yeah. He was the um, I think it was the Sia was made captain of the Stormers. Or Evan was made captain of the Stormers, and then Sia was then um, made after that. So I mean, Evan can be, but he well, he was going to be this year for his art. He was. He did captain us this year as well. He did captain us side, yeah. No, and I think my, my for my point on Evan is is for me when he's not captain, he plays better rugby. Um, yeah. And that's not to say he's there's, not a leader. There's, there's a because... saying in football which says where they say don't captain your weapon. You know, there are certain play, yeah. there are certain players who thrive under the captaincy. I think Sir Khalisi, the yeah. captaincy, brought the best out of him. I think Bongi Manambi, I think they gave him that extra responsibility. And he said, right, you know, now I need to lift myself up. And I think there are some players who, you know, can can walk out there without the captaincy and say, right, I'm just, I think PSF the toys a player like that, you know. I yeah. think there are certain players yeah. who could be captains and could be great captains. But, you know, not giving them the title, not giving them that responsibility means they can just focus on being in Evan's case, the best lock in the world and one of the best locks of all time. Yeah, exactly. Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, no, it's been, it's been terrible. So many of those signs to out at the, uh, at the thing. But yeah, right. So we've got a lot to talk about. We've got plenty of time to talk about the box as well. So I'm going to move to our betting segment before we're going to move to, to the URC. Uh, somebody was earlier was asking where they're staying in Cape Town. I have no idea. Um, there will be a town hall tomorrow at half past 10. It's when the uh, parade starts. Um, so that's where you guys need to head out if you want to watch check out about tomorrow um just a second you guys name a Springbok 15 line up under 30 years old i think we might need to do that on a upcoming show maybe that'll be fun we can actually try and uh, we can actually do a little bit of research and i think you know we'll tell you we try and bring their own teams and we can start seeing who who everybody's got um chris make a good point saying maybe stephen kitsov is captain he's he's in the right sort of age gap i think he's about 29 so so he could potentially be an option um but let's move into our betty segment and uh yeah chris is uh, in the comments but not here tonight unfortunately uh so we're going to move to so you're, you're gonna have the btech uh, crow tips here and the stevie p tips <laughs> um right so the good news is last week we won chris is on a roll as you can see a 53 percent return on investment there we are up 27.47 units and uh yeah last week we backed uh, argentina and plus seven uh, with, a, with a single and one that and a storm is at uh, minus 23.5 handicap which also won so two wins last week so great stuff there from uh, from chris he has given us a bet this week and this is all on ball sports by the way we had a bunch of people last week who won free bets uh, on their ball sports account and we are going to be giving away more free bets uh um, this weekend as well as on our super brew so if you guys do not, if you guys are slacking, if you guys are, are late to the party, I'm going to put the link in right now. 
go and sign up for Boyle Sports. You get a sign up bonus up to a thousand rand uh, up in in to that, and they're going to be giving us a. At the moment, there is a special running for the URC where if you sign up, um, and you can win your share of ten thousand rand, um, with the, with the better uh, URC. So go out and get that. Um, all you gotta do is take a fifty rand bet on the URC between uh, the third and twenty sixth of November. And uh, you can win your share of ten thousand rand in extra bets. Which, if uh, if, I, if I'm if, if you're intelligent, you basically watch the show. You you find out what Chris is betting on, and you put those free bets on there, and you can win big. So lots of very cool things. Boil Sports doing. If you guys are new, haven't seen it, go and join our Super Brew. Uh, they're going to be giving us free bets every week for the top player of the week, random and stuff like that. So get yourself a Boil Sports account. Let's start betting. Let's start making some money. It's Christmas time. You know, I'm already seeing the decorations. The the wallet is burning for, for the South kids. We've got Care December <laughs> coming up. So we've got to start getting ready for, for that, um, as well as January worries. So prevent your January worries by, by getting in on the ball of sports. So for this week, uh, Chris has cooked up a little double. He's, he's, he's advising two and a half units. I've actually gone and put that on before the show. Uh, he's gone with the money line sale to beat uh, Gluster, which is tomorrow. And then he's back in lines on plus 11.5 versus Benetton on a Sunday. Um, that comes out at 1.85 currently on the markets over there at Boyle Sports. So that is the advice from the Mr. The Crow Tips. Um, although if this does win, it, I'm 100 taking it as as my as my tips. And if it's lose, then we'll throw this back to <laughs> back to Chris. Um, right, chaps. One more thing I would like to well, I'd like to get stuck, get stuck into here. Um, and uh, where's I'm, I want I want to find out how much of the, the URC you you're planning on watching and 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 uh, and what's going on here. But we've got URC action this weekend, and uh, the nice thing is not the nice thing, but um, because it is uh, the, the World Cup is finished, uh, it means we can sort of give the URC a little bit of the attention it maybe deserves and has been getting over the last few uh, weeks and stuff like that. So these are some of the fixtures. Uh, before we even talk about, you know, who we backing and stuff like that, the URC is in London uh, tomorrow night. Dan, you going to watch? No, where's where's it? <laughs> <laughs> at, at at the stupid Twickenham. Ooh, maybe. <laughs> there you go. We're just just throwing out some little Friday plans to Dan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll check the calendar. Why yeah, not? Yeah. So Ospreys versus the Sharks tomorrow. That is happening over. Um, at, at the stoop, and uh, tomorrow night also got Glasgow Warriors versus the Stormers. Uh, Dan, I am, I believe you're a Stormers fan, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And uh, you know, what, what are you, what are we thinking for the season? And, and you know, the team has been announced. You've got Sasha, Fame, and Gomez, you still in that 12 jersey. Um, Evan Ruiz in the number seven. That's something I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, Dan, how are you feeling about the Stormers this season? I mean, they've, they've started hot and as hot as they they have been over the last couple of seasons. I, I was at that final in Munster beat us at the, at the stadium. And it was a very, very somber evening after that. Um, but they've, they've embodied everything you kind of want out of a South African club. I think they are doing the most to kind of put people in a position to take the next step to the spring box. And they've been really dominating, put people to the sword. And I mean, if there's, you know, if a Springbok fan has faith in Russi, I have just as much faith in Dobbo. I absolutely love him. And I, I do think, I don't think it'll be now, but I think one day he'll actually be in the Springbok setup. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're, you're pretty right there. Right, uh, where's uh, Evan Lewis at seven? Surprised? Uh, excited? What's, what's your thinking there? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was lots of hype and chats about Evan coming into, into the Springbok squad and he just didn't, quite find his groove i think you know with a tight tight space to fit into for a very big man already i think the squad was gelling well and as we said and you know we spoke earlier about the right people and the right fit and potentially with that combination of guys that it wasn't quite there so so why not i think it's still you know early days for him and and potentially try it out see what works and and I mean, he's, he's a very good eight so if if it doesn't work out at seven there's the potential to go back to a position he's more comfortable at and do you think there's a certain amount of you know positions or maybe even numbers in the back becoming arbitrary? You know, the, the box is showing that to a certain degree that you know just yeah. because you are a, you wear eight in the back doesn't mean you're a traditional eight man. Um, yeah. You know, so how much do you think this is also first of all it adds a bit of versatility? You know, you can learn what, how life is on the side of the scrum. But do you think we're moving towards a time where where numbers are maybe a little bit less, uh, a little bit more arbitrary and 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 less sort of 
constrictive with regards to what your role is. Absolutely. I mean, I think if you look at like, if you look at Malcolm Marx, the hookers we've had, you know, they're mobile. If you look at Dan Coles, like absolutely Yeah, he, mobile, he revolutionized you know, the hooker position. 100%. And, you know, even Kitsy likes to get his hands on the ball. He's mobile-ish around the park, you know. Um, when, when I don't think he would like have appreciated to... that ish part, eh? <laughs> Very mobile-ish around the park. Um, <laughs> No, I love you, kids. Um, but no, he's, he's so, so. Yeah, Steve, I'm with you there. I think, I think, you know, we spoke about it. Everyone has their role, and just because you're in this number jersey, you know, maybe your role is to do X, not Y, and the next guy who comes in is to do X and Y and Z. So I, I, I think that versatile player is huge. We look at Quaka Smith, right? The Swiss Army knife of rugby players, um, you know, and and what he can do, and and. I think that's what we want to try and focus on is, is everyone, or people who can fit in everywhere. And the, the risk, though, is potentially overgeneralizing, you know, and, and maybe going too broad and getting Oaks to do yeah. too much. But I don't, I don't think that's what we're doing. I think we're, we're identifying where guys can contribute positively and encouraging those, you know, two or three assets and values. I, yeah. I, I would agree. I, I would disagree at scrum time because I still think mm, that there's, there, like, Maybe less so, you know, I think line outs, not too much. You can choose to be a part of the pods, lifting, stuff like that. I think that's a lot more learnable. But I think there are, as you mentioned, if you do become too generalistic, there are, you know, very good they're under, responsibilities as a number eight at a scrum and a, as a number six and a number seven that are, that are very intrinsic. I do think that even potentially to an extent, Evan Rose could have gone to Dobbo and said, I need to, you know, diversify myself. Like he's seen what how what the Springboks value, and mm -hmm. he didn't fit into one position, and he didn't make the World Cup. Maybe if he was better as a, if he was seen as as good of a flank, versatile, yeah, as as a, as, a, as a flanky, maybe maybe he was in the World Cup squad and now World Cup winner, you know. So I think I think maybe it's on these players' minds, but. You know, so basically what you're saying is that people are arriving at preseason now and you've got like, you know, your your props are busy like practicing their throwing, you've got like <laughs> wings who are busy practicing their jackling and scrum technique, and everyone's just trying to like add add different sort of you know strings to the bow. So they're like, well, this is the only way I'm gonna be able to select. I need to be able to play outside center wing as well as scrum off and hooker. Uh yes, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay. No, it's an interesting point. And again, so so interesting to see how because there's always been certain positions we, we have been able to sort of replicate. You know, it's not, you know, that whole sort of number five to number seven, you know, playing playing at lock to flank a, a very specific flank because they've been able to do it. PSF the toy is a is a is a lock converted to to flank. Frank and Mosser did that very well, British Irish Line. Scott Barrister, there's a lot of people, Ty Byrne, who I think is probably the world leader in terms of being able to be as good at, at lock as he is on the flank. Um, but it's interesting to see how people now sort of adding more to that, you know, where they're not just, yeah. you know, being able to go from very similar roles, to the, you know, but but very different roles. I mean, for example, like Quaker Smith, we can play across the back three, you know, um, as well as on the wing and stuff like that. But yeah. he is a bit of a player in in isolation. Um, other fixtures, we've got Zebra taking on the Bulls. Uh, don't see that going particularly well for the Italians, who did push Ulster pretty far. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, this bull side is absolutely stacked, and that's before they get the likes of Kane and Moody, a Billy Leroux, and a, a Kirkley Orange back into the mix there. Leicester versus Edinburgh, I reckon that's probably your game of the weekend when it comes to, to the URC, so I think that's going to be a great watch. Um, what makes it interesting, obviously, a lot of players are still coming slowly coming back from the from the World Cup. So, for example, uh, for Glasgow Warriors tomorrow night, uh, I think Sunio Topolotto is back. Matt Ferguson is playing. Richie Gray is playing. There's a couple of players starting to get back. But, um, yeah, not all of these squads are sort of back to full strength. Uh, you've got the Scarlets taking on Carla tomorrow at, um, on Saturday night at 7 o'clock, same time as Munster versus Dragons. Uh, you think of Connacht versus Ulster in a Interpro. Uh, over there in Ireland, and then the final game of the weekend, it is Benetton taking on the Lions. Uh, Lions searching for their first victory of the of the, the tournament have come up within points, you know, two games in a row, one against Stormers, one against uh, Edinburgh last week. So really looking to try and find that first uh, win there. So a pretty stacked weekend of URC rugby, and uh, very cool to sort of be able to get back to that. And um, yeah, so chaps, just in closing, um, it's something that I wanted to talk about. A little bit is just the possibility of a three-peat. <laughs> Here we yeah. go. Let's start. Let's go. You know, just very, very quickly. 
<laughs> what do you what do you guys think? I mean, is it possible? First of all, no team's ever done it. No, not on the run that we. Um, if we have the, a similar run into the final that we did this year, there's no ways. The, yeah. the men will be far too old and and frail. <laughs> I, think, I think we need it's a big like, it's a big shot starts uh, you know suggesting that even it's it's going to be frail yeah i mean <laughs> frailer if that's a word <laughs> but mobile ish i mean they have they have said they have they have said that um he said yes it's a lot closer to yeah. the actual world cup starting than it did mm. you know like not two years before and you know that's a genius move that i can't believe they didn't think about beforehand but you know so so there will be a more equal will draw in that sense so we shouldn't you should never see kind of what the springboks kind of had to go through or anyone on the for me side. for me it's what scotland had to go through when you think it was a golden generation of scotland yeah. players that they could have yeah. very well got themselves to a semi-final and they were robbed of the chance because they played against the number one side in the world and the eventual champions yeah <laughs> but know? to answer your question steve 100 percent yes three peeps on like three peeps. <laughs> three peeps on. I, like i i could see it see is going to be there and I don't know who's going to be beside him. Most of most of the boys, I think. But Kane and Moody will still be nineteen. Kane and Moody, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cocker yeah. Smith still going to have a fix his nose, you know. And where's actually bad luck if he fix, fixes his nose now? No, he, he can't. He like can't. It's, 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 um, um, yeah. No, I mean, if, you know, people always what Mandela quote: "It's always impossible until someone does it." So you know, like it, it will. It someone will break that one day. Um, someone will get the three peat and and I really hope it's us. And again, if we continue the form and to build, and I've said the word a lot tonight, but the culture and there was a there was a lack of comment earlier on, and I actually missed it, but it was talking about the the depth in the squad that we've built um, and and how that allowed us to do so successful. and and the commenter, sorry, I missed your comment, but it was it was just, talking about how, how many players we had and how many substitutions we made and changes. And again, it was yeah, building that depth. There we go. Thank you very much, Steve. So the last 26 tests, we played 52 players, made 301 changes uh, during that time, an average of 7.5 changes the starting 50. I mean, that's huge, you know, and, it's, and, and we spoke about it in the World Cup and the build-up. Is it too disruptive? You know, are, are guys not able to find their gel and this and that? And I think now is the time to do that. You know, in the, in the lead-up, the, the two, three years before the World Cup, you make those changes. You try every combination. You see who works with whom. And, and then in that last year, you know, year and a half, leading up to the World Cup, you really start to finesse and cement things. And um, if we can do that, and, and we've got the, the hiss and the spirits and that no ego, there's absolutely no reason I don't see us, you know, absolutely take, lifting the cup down in Australia. Right, sign it, seal it, ship it off to you. Oz, we're going to be there. We're going to watch them lift it, and uh, yeah, the web. I don't, I don't think the web Venus trophy can do another trophy to it. The amount of brandy that that poor trophy has had to hold <laughs> for the last four years. I mean, it just must be. It, it must be like melting away from the from 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 the bottom down. I mean, it's just been. It must be looking forward to somebody else winning it just just to have a bit of a break because yeah, the, the yeah. abuse that poor trophy has had is, is unmatched. <laughs> what, what I will say is, that imagine the, I think. Genuinely, I think there will be major changes made to rugby if the Springboks win another World Cup and if we sure. win it in a similar person. Like, I genuinely think that will happen. Like, yeah. people will literally start speaking of it like it's an unfair advantage and that it, they, they shouldn't be allowed to just play the way they want to um, because, like, you know, if you're a neutral fan, it, it's it's boring <laughs> because that, it's boring to only see South Africa one, not not boring to see the way. You know, I feel like we, I feel like we saw twenty years of New Zealand dominance. To be fair, not outside of World Cup years. So, like, yeah, I, just, I mean, I we just, just relax. Yeah. No, but see, you know, to be serious, obviously, you never know who's going to be peaking at the right times at the World Cup and who's going to kind of be able to take that in. All you know is that in the furthest possible way to what the pro tiers have is that we can remain so calm in that time that we don't box have always in with a chance i think that's the main thing you know there's certain things you know new zealand are, can never be written off the box are always in with a chance Ireland can't get past quarter final and you know it's yeah so 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 that's so that's what we know we, we do know so far when it comes to world cups we have to wait and see if that's going to be true come four years time we'll all be a little bit older um and michael checker will be there 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just certain constants. And Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones will be in charge of a different team as well. Yeah, um, yeah. he'll be like Chile or something like that. Right, people, thank you very much for joining us. To to Dan and Wes, thank you very much for your time. Dan's going to go and shave um, because, as you can see, we are on the November train. So uh, I'm going to put a link in. I'm going to put a, a message on the on the community. We are doing November as a forever sports uh, group. We are busy putting pressure on the likes of Ariza to join us. And um, so Wes has done his shave. Um, I've done my shave. Dan shaved an hour ago, so he's going to go reshave again. <laughs> so you, can, you can come join us. Um, but if you guys would like to join the team, we'll put, we are going to put a link up there so that we can get into the November spirit. And uh, yeah, if you guys would like to donate as well towards a very worthy cause, then we'll have that link there as well. So uh, let us know if you are going to join us on the November trend. Uh, we're going to basically be telling Wes exactly what we want to see um, from a stylistic point of view and uh, it should be it should be quite a fun uh, and then i think you know when, once Wes gets back to Joburg and even dan i think we might need to get archaeus name and then the clippers out and, and start uh <laughs> seeing if we can we can we can get a couple of archaeus name and haircuts there but uh do you know, you know, if I, job, I would have that haircut brother D no do I, it for I, the I, people I, do it for the people, <laughs> people. <laughs> tell you what we get to when we when, if, if we get to a hundred thousand subscribers in the next like six months i'll do it okay that's Let's go, there. people. Start subscribing. <laughs> yeah. if you haven't already. You, know, you, like you see, you see, you see, someone, someone's buying bots. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need a lot of world rugby spice <laughs> to happen. Yeah. <laughs> just need Rusty Russell to release another video. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Stay will be watching. Thanks as always. Please make sure you do subscribe to the channel. Let's see if we can get Stephen Archie's name and haircut. Um, I have to get to the gym to try and make that work. So I'm going to need a bit of time. Thank you, but. Uh, yeah, we'll see you guys all next week. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.